morning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this last day of holomorphic dynamics in the tropics. Screen. Uh, oh, let's not be that pessimistic. <laughs> for the, of the conference, that's what I mean, right? So our first speaker, I'm glad to say, is uh, Adam Epstein from uh, University of Warwick. And you'll be talking about Not this near title. parabolic <laughs> phenomena in two-dimensional parameter spaces, or? Uh, near parabolic phenomena in parameter dimension two. Great. All right, so, the, um, before I even start, there, just, there are some pictures I need to show, and they're embedded in a sort of non-extractable way in some old files. So this is not necessarily one of the ones I'm referring to, but it's a pretty picture to have up there until we get to the ones that are, that are directly relevant. Uh, <laughs> so, um, sorry? I've started. I'm, na I'm now starting. That was, that was section minus one. Section zero, <laughs> section zero labeled introduction. Um, I need these. All right, so. I would like to thank the organizers on many levels, not only for organizing this wonderful conference, but for making it possible for me to attend given circumstances. So I've probably told half the people here individually, I might as well say it publicly now. For various personal reasons, I was not really following my correspondence over the summer. <laughs> And uh, I had the distinct impression that I had missed this conference. I somehow, when it was rescheduled initially, I somehow had the sense that it was going to be in June, in, in July. Um, well, maybe no, uh, no, August, right? So the beginning, so, and late in July, I was getting emails with, with last names, you know, among people here. And I wasn't up to it, and it wasn't right. And so I thought, well, you know, at some point or another, we'll get to the end of the month, and then that will mean I'll have missed that conference, and gee, isn't that too bad, but I just can't handle it. And that's indeed what happened. That email petered out. And then maybe about a month and a half later, I started getting some similar emails. And again, the headers, sometimes the headers were in Portuguese, and one or two might have said Carson Fest. And I just like, oh, this is the conference proceedings. You know, second announcement is like, you know, I can't even show my face. So I ignored those also. And then uh, these were accumulating. And then there was some other thing I, I, I went to open. By mistake, I clicked on the email from, from Christian. And it said something like, you know, final announcement on November 20th. Like, well, well geez, it's only November, uh, you know, 18th. My God, maybe I, maybe I could still go to this. But of course, then we had this huge friction-laden policy to get Trump, right? Moss is saying, are you guys, I don't know if I'm going. And then up and basically up until five hours before the flight I eventually got in, it was not even clear. Uh, first, if there was a ticket, then if my credit card would work, et cetera. And Luna really facilitated things, you know, in that last minute and made it possible for me to come. And I really appreciate that. Hmm? Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I want to say a few more words before I uh, go on. So um, it depends on, as always, it depends on the precise details of definitions, right? But by, by what I would say is the most reasonable definition of my, you know, say, working peers, um, working co uh, collaborators, I'm pretty sure Karsten is the one that I have known the longest. I mean, I've certainly met people in holomorphic dynamics before, but they were people who were older, et cetera. Oh, well, Karsten's older, but not that much. But, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, and of course there were, I mean, and then there's any number of people in that same cohort who are slightly younger that I, you know, met in quick succession in the several years after, you know, the later years of graduate school, early years of postdocs. But thinking about it, I am pretty sure that, say, within this crowd, certainly, Karsten is the one I met first. And I don't have exact dates, but it would have been June of 1991. Um, and this is an IHES. So my advisor, Dennis Sullivan, had decided, also at the very last minute, that I and another student should go to uh, 
work with him in France. Actually, it turned out what he really wanted us to do was to transport a huge tub of uh, baby formula that was somehow not available in France. So the two of us were there like lugging this rather large container of white powder. <laughs> <laughs> like, like through customs, in fr and we got there, and then Dan's like, oh, thanks, right, and then, oh, you know, okay, we'll talk about your thesis, you know, later, right, so we got ourselves to IHES, we're staying in Ormai, and there were various people there, so Karsten was there, I guess you were there with your family, right, and were Pia and Dan there, because I met them around the same time, too, but I can't picture, they were all, okay, Not some, there were quite a few Danes, or my at the time. So um, I, um, I have a footnote here. It's possible, I mean, he had a, I may, he had a short preprint out called Groach Defect, and I may or may not have seen that before. So I may, have, I may or may not have known the name Karsten Peterson before. But certainly I met him uh, in June of 91. And then um, about a month later, I'm saying July of 91, I didn't look it up, there was the, um, Big conference at Stony Brook. In fact, it was Milner's 60th birthday. That's a little bit of perspective. <laughs> it's Milner's 60th birthday. And um, there was a talk. I mean, there was two weeks' worth of talks. So there was a talk, and I found myself in the very, very back of this large lecture room, and Karsten was in the adjoining chair. And I don't know, maybe we were paying attention to the talk, maybe we weren't, right? But what transpired was we somehow had this totally nonverbal conversation that involved drawing little pictures right, of various parabolic phenomena. And there were no words exchanged. But he drew a picture, and I recognized it, or at least I recognized it for my own purposes. And I drew it. So let me just draw a sample. Because this later on appeared, not this conversation, but I mean, his motivation for it. This had something to do with blaster products, and this later on appeared in various talks of his, I saw, and probably papers. But if I can draw this here, configuration. For some reason or other, I, my personal name for these is daisy chains, but I don't think that term appears in print anywhere. Maybe this is going around a big circle or something, I don't know. But this is sort of obviously a parabolic basin. But then here's another one, and there's this little, little cuspidal region here, and a little bit of this sort of sticks in your And think, configurations like this, uh, I think, come up or can generate some of the uh, scenarios that came up in Saeed's talk, for example. Um, I don't know if this was an implosion, implosion motivated or not. But anyway, so he drew a picture, and then, I don't know, maybe it's possible that I drew a picture of uh, the uh, you know, parabolic basin for the exponential or something. And it was just sort of going back and forth like this, uh, you know, for the second half of that talk. So I remembered that. That was, uh, it was a nice conversation. Um, OK, and then um, a few years later, two years later, um, I think it was June of 93, there was this utterly massive conference in Hillrod in Denmark. Right, this, is around, this, is, this is around the time I realized that, that, that my career was going to involve many trips to Denmark. Right, you know, who'd have thunk it, right? You, just, you don't know until you get into it exactly where a certain subject is, uh, is predominant. And at Hillrod, I, I met lots of other people, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's certainly where I met Nuria. Um, I probably met Xavier at something in between Illumini and 92. Okay. And none of those people are having a 60th birthday quite yet. OK, so let me, uh, let me proceed to the math. So um, I didn't give an abstract. I was trying to write down an abstract, and I was getting paralyzed. But I mean, so I write here, in lieu of abstract, I'm supposed to say something like, um, <sighs> parabolic implosion is in some sense a niche activity. In fact, I was going to even put it in the quote and say, it's not a spectator sport, except here you are. But um, the thing about parabolic implosion, and I've had private discussions, I've discussed this with Savi many times, there's, there's a certain investment in the beginning of setup, and it takes a lot of time to actually get it right, and to get it in the right generality takes a lot of time. And somehow, even though it's been the general setup has been exposited now a few times, 
somehow there's always an application that seems to require a reworking. I, I don't think the right presentation of it has converged yet. In, well, that's true of anything, but I mean this in a particular sense. I'll mention this. There's a construction involved. You, you call the, the dua de coordinates and perturbed they call cylinders. And there are some choices in that that conceivably depend on coordinates. The choices clearly disappear in the limit. But me being who I am, I, I want to see a presentation of it where it's you know invariant from the get-go, and I don't know how to do it. Um, but anyway, so that's the part I'm not going to talk about today, because I will get all gummed up in it. We won't get any, and and uh, and everyone's eyes will glaze over. So what I'm going to be doing is essentially assuming I'll describe what that theory hands you. I'll give a couple of references where you can look that up, and then I'm going to say, okay, given this. Given this in the background, how can we cash that out? In I'm going to give you some interesting scenarios that aren't typically uh, discussed because this, this is the higher dimensional, higher dimensional parameter space part. Right. At this point, there's lots and lots of well-known applications of parabolic implosion, say, for the quadratic family. So even spectators have seen that. But higher dimension, well, Parabolic implosion for multiple parabolics, or in particular, really what I mean is the, the associated parameter space phenomenology that you can investigate and reveal using those tools. There really aren't that many applications out there, and it's rarely talked about. So in some sense, that's what I'm here to do today. But because I'm not going to be delving into all of this formalism of describe, right? I mean, I'm going to be essentially presenting that by caricature. Um, you'll see what I mean when I get to it. So uh, that's the abstract. <laughs> OK, and what I should say is there's a sense in which the original, I mean, even from the very beginning, even in the very, very beginning, there was an application of parabolic implosion of degenerate parabolics. Okay, degenerate, I mean, I'll say this formally in a minute, but degenerate parabolic, be focusing on multiplier one, and what I mean here is something whose next term is cubic rather than quadratic, so that perturbing this, perturbation of this has three colliding fixed points, typically rather than just two. And the natural Deformation space for this is two parameters rather than one. So already just figuring out how to make a picture, since these are, I want to talk about genuinely multidimensional phenomena, just figuring out what to try to draw a picture of is not so easy. Um, in fact, it may well be that going through the motions, it may well be that the parabolic implosion activity itself perhaps suggests after the fact, what pictures to make, which in fact is true of one of the applications I'm going to show. But back in the early days, and I'm going to get this name up before I forget. I'll put it up again. But so the th thesis of Lavor's is really the first place where there was any kind of a systematically readable exposition of implosion, at least from my point of view. And in that, he actually has a carefully worked out discussion that applies in this case. He writes it up for this case. It's clear that what he does would work in that generality. He doesn't go any farther. He doesn't explicitly treat this case. And in fact, in fact, when you look at what he does, he basically treats things with his bare hands. And you just would not be able to do that with a higher degree. I mean, in other words, he doesn't even, I mean, nowadays what we know is we're supposed to be looking at vector fields as a caricature for the perturbations, right? And that sort of gives, but this, is, this already came after. That, that, that came about in the work of Shishikura a few days later. So, um, so he's just doing things by hand, and he's able to do it here. But once he does that, he cashes out. In some sense, the killer application at the time was the non-local connectivity of the connectedness locus well, or in degree three, but it's clear that anything, any, it, it, the argument will clearly work in any degree. It's just a matter of waiting for that presentation of uh, implosion to catch up. Right? So what he, he, I don't have a picture. There's a picture of the real slice of it in various works of Jack and in my paper with Mitri Ampolsky. But basically, there's, a, there's an argument that proves that you have a comb 
This is a picture in R2, but it's really happening in C2. So these comb things here are somehow picked out by a winding number argument. The winding number argument's carried out uh, in a certain par parameter space involving, involving these so-called horn maps, which are the main actors in this parabolic renormalization discussion. Right, so you have to learn all of those techniques, all those constructions, but when, once you learn them, you can essentially look at certain pictures and infer, or partially infer, that there are certain interesting things happening in the original parameter space. So what's, that's done here by Lavores is a genuinely two-parameter application where he finds some kind of comb-like thing enough to get non-local connectivity. So this is already 1989, right? And then I'm just trying to think how many actual applications of multiple parabolic implosion have I seen or heard of since then? And there's not many. There's not many. In fact, I'm not sure there's any between Lavoie's. I'm definitely sure there's not any between Lavoie's and, uh, and the things I'll talk about today, and at, more recently there is. Uh, Luo has, uh, has some work, and it probably has some bearing on one of the things I'll mention here at the end, but I'm not expert on what he's done. So, all right, so I need to say something about parabolic points, just to be definite here. So, uh, all the people here my age know this, but there's people here I don't know. So, uh, all right, as a general philosophical, okay, so parabolic is going to mean when the multiplier is one or more generally a root of unity because I'm you know, always reduced to things by taking a finite iterate if necessary. Why is multiplier one significant in dynamics? Well, I mean, because it's, it is pervasive. And I guess I would have to say that, um, I mean, one complex variable, multiplier one, means, let's say the origin is fixed, so that means that, well, whatever, I just drew it over there, but this M here, I'll call this the parabola here. Let's see, I could normalize that away to one, but I'll just leave it now. So this M will be called the, say, parabolic multiplicity or para parabolic degeneracy, maybe. Or something like that. So m equals one is the so-called simple parabolic case, right? But you might actually have lots and lots of vanishing terms before you get that. And you know, in some, in it's purely formal. But if m is very large, this is somehow very, very close to the identity. Um, and I just I remember this was Lisa Goldberg saying this once to me in a taxi cab, and I remember it saying it's like somehow it's like you know the identity map. It seems like the most trivial thing dynamically, right? Because nothing ever happens. That's true if you're just looking there, but if you're looking at perturbations of the identity, that's probably the richest field there is because the identity map is very, very, very unstable. And I remember her saying it that way, and, and yeah. So this is, I guess, philosophically, if you want to go there, why in any dynamical discussion with anyone Multiplier one, multiplier roots of unity are important. Higher dimensional complex, uh, higher dimensional dynamics, of course, there are resonance issues associated with all that. So that's the motivation here. Um, now, getting back to one complex variable, um, I don't know this well. I'll, I'll postpone that until I get it. So I'm gonna, I just want to draw a picture here. So there's a picture. I have colored chalk here. So, here. so m equals one first. I'm just going to draw the local picture. So the, uh, the buzzword here is FATU coordinates. So here's my parabolic point. And the dynamics is as follows. There's a region here that you should think of as a half plane, because it is a half plane in the appropriate coordinate. And you just march in, you know, without ever getting there. And then that's corresponding to going out here. If I invert, if I took the inverse, it would just be going the other way. So I have a Fatou coordinate here, where things are locally conjugate to a translation in a half plane. I guess a uh, right half plane. Or this is a left, this is a left half plane. And uh, wait a minute. Well, whatever. One of these is left and one of them is right. OK, but the point is that, except, except in completely uninteresting situations, this coordinate and this coordinate are different, and everything is all about here in the overlap. 
And what's subtle about it is you, if you just expand things out in power series in the original coordinates, both of these have the same expansion. Everything here, uh, the difference is uh, beyond all orders. You just don't see it. You can only see it by performing a certain transcendental operation, which we call, well, perhaps parabolic renormalization. Right, so what is that? So if you take translation by one and take the quotient, right, you get, you get C mod Z, which I'm going to actually work with as C star. I prefer the multiplicative notation. And you get a quotient of C mod Z over here also. So are they the same? Well, no. All right, so again, this is one of these things that I learned from my advisor and probably, uh, probably too much of a stickler about it, but it's like, you know, it's very, very, very rare in math. When you're talking about abstract mathematical objects as opposed to like the number two or something like that, it's extremely rare that things are actually equal, right? The things that you talk about are equal. They're right, they're isomorphic, they might be canonically isomorphic, et cetera, right? So in fact, this is a Riemann surface. This is a uh, doubly connected Riemann surface of uh, infinite modulus, and there's one up to, and, and there's one up to a non-unique isomorphism. There's a one-parameter family of isomorphisms, because once I have one, I can translate up, and I could also flip. I could do an inversion. In this coordinate, I could do a 1 over z. So here's one, and here's one. And by some coincidence, they're isomorphic. And also, because they come from this situation, the, uh, the ends are labeled. So I could say that the north and south poles here are as I've configured them here. And then what that picks out, canonically, is a one-parameter family of isomorphisms between these. Okay, and that's just for fun. At the moment, this has nothing to do with this picture. Okay, so there's a quotient map on this side, and there's a quotient map on this side. And look, you can't get from here to here. Okay, but you can still consider this, right? Now, what can you do? What you can do is go from here. See, because of this overlap, you can go from here to here. You can't see that. You can go from here, I'm going to use a different color than this one here. You can go from, <laughs> you can go from here to here. You can go from here to here via this overlap here. And that corresponds to some return, some map between the ends here. But you see, that's not dynamics until you put something like this in. You put something like this in, you create some dynamics down here, right? Now, at this point, you have an interesting dynamical system down here, and you can just have fun with it, and you can just stay there, which is largely what I ended up doing in my thesis, is I got so, you know, I mean, I was trying to set up, I mean, I mean, it was all motivated by doing some parabolic implosions, but before I could do the applications, of course, I wanted the general structure, because that's the way you do mathematics, that's the way Borbaki did math, whatever, graduate student fantasies. Um, but... In the course of doing it, I realized that there were all these things. And I mean, again, in Lavoie's thesis, every chapter, every chapter was about something else, right? And then there's like the two or three chapters that motivated my thesis, which was essentially studying the dynamics of horn maps and associated towers. And then there were the two or three chapters that motivated Woodkirk's thesis about writing, you know, reworking this in a cleaner way using vector fields and getting the higher degeneracy part. There was a section that I didn't read at all, which is about the landing properties of rays, which Said was discussing, and Alex Kapiamba has some work on as well, also referring back to all of that. So anyway, so I just kind of enjoyed playing around down here. But the fact is this has, so if I choose an isomorphism here, and there's a choice, there's a one, per, fix a parabolic here, a simple parabolic, that determines these cylinders, that determines these return maps here, which are almost surely nonlinear. And then there's a one parameter family of linear things. Now I have a one parameter family of dynamical systems. I can have fun. Okay? And but what's important to know is that these dynamical systems that you make down here, besides just being fun, and these are, by the way, transcendental dynamical systems. This is an infinite to one map with a natural boundary, et cetera. But anything you do down there actually has an interpretation upstairs, or at least morally. Maybe you have to go seek it. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes there's a phenomenon upstairs, and you prove it by doing something downstairs. So what is the relation? So that, that relation is what is usually called parabolic implosion. Sorry, I can't hear you. 
Why is it in, okay, yeah, I'll show, yeah, yeah, good, let me show you that. Okay, look, in the general case where I just start with a germ, everything's a germ discussion, and I'm really just at the ends here, so of course everything's locally one-to-one. -one. But when you have some actually interesting global dynamics going on, yeah, this is very good, this needs to be here. Let's say the cauliflower. Oops, that's not a good cauliflower. So, looking over here, at this picture here. So, this return dynamics is defined only at the end here. How far up does the domain go? It's however much of it came from the basin as opposed to what's outside the basin. Now, locally near at the tips, this return is just one to one, but the closer and closer you get to the boundary here, you start running into all these pre-critical points, right? So you develop something, you might loosely call it an infinite degree branch cover. I, I prefer to call it something else, but uh, it's a finite type map, right? But it's certainly infinite degree. Um, so thank you, that's, 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 that, that was important to say. Um, because, of course, anything I'm going to be cashing out is actually going to be making, well, not everything, but many things would be making use of that. Now, suppose you play this game here. I mean, so, for example, there'll be all of these. So, down here, on the, if, if we're in this case here, there's this one critical orbit. Let me redraw my picture here now in this global setting here. So, there'll be this one critical orbit, which I might as well... I'll just label that as this orange. So there's a distinguished point on this cylinder here. So if I want to, I could coordinateize it so that that's one. That's an artifact of there just being one point in the basin. And then on this cylinder here, there's an actual decoration, which is the projection of this Julia set boundary, this fractally thing here. And my horn map, which is infinite to one, is defined here. And in particular, there are all these critical points here that get mapped to here. So there's a collection of transit isomorphisms, that's what we'll call you, of, of psi. I could choose to send that orange point to any one of those, and then, of course, it will go back, so that would give me a super-attracting, um, well, fixed point or two-cycle, depending how you look at it. And these accumulate densely at the boundary, right? So you can look at this picture here and see that, and then infer things upstairs. And the process of inferring upstairs involves the so-called perturbed picture. I guess I'll write it over here. So if you take z plus z squared and perturb it a little bit, but perturb it in a way that changes the multiplier, that, un that splits that parabolic into two, well, exactly what the picture looks like depends on circumstances. If you split that in a purely, say, real way, with, you know, multiplier, with the multipliers are just tending, let's say, as real numbers, something, say, from below one and something from above one, then actually what you get isn't particularly interesting. It's the so-called non-implosive case. But if the perturbation is such that the multipliers are tending to one tangentially to the unit circle, so if this is my multiplier space, and this is the unit disk, I'm being a little bit vague here, but there's only two multipliers involved in the simple case, so I'm not doing any harm here. Approaches like this are quite different. So one of the earliest things that was observed, and I don't know how early, 82 is uh, an upper bound, uh, that Julia sets behave discontinuously, and the entire mechanism has to do with understanding that tangential convergence to one of multipliers um, has consequences. And the way you read off those consequences is exactly this theory. So in this sort of setting here, this picture here becomes this picture. This opens up a little bit here, but my original crescent-shaped fundamental domains are pretty close to the way they were before. And similarly on this side. And you need to do a little bit of analytic estimation, but the quotient is still a, uh, a cylinder over here, a binary cylinder, and this one also. And I still have my return dynamics at the ends. And all the estimates, all the rigor and theory, all that tells you, in fact, that these maps at the ends here converge to these maps at the ends here. But you get something else, because while this channel is open, you can go through. So you get 
Additionally, in the near parabolic setting, you get an isomorphism like that. And then, and then, if you move carefully enough, meaning if you pass to a subsequence, you can arrange so that in the limit, this isomorphism remains stable and converges to this thing that you just picked out of your, your hat over here. And the theory tells you in a quantitative way that any one of these isomorphisms you want can be achieved that way. And it, you know, and it gives you the asymptotics of it, et cetera, right? Now, I don't know, ex I, I would actually like to know exactly how and when uh, Duadi, who I believe is the one who figured out this construction and then basically handed it to Lavores and said, come up with some applications of it. But exactly, Hubbard, Hubbard has said things like this in, the, in talks, but I don't remember it. No doubt it happened in some cafe in Paris. But the idea that you should look and still try to draw these fundamental domains and do this for the first time strikes me as remarkable. Uh, you know, I mean, how could you possibly understand what it means to get over it? If you can replace it by a one iterate thing, there's a hope. Right? And in fact, it reveals all sorts of things. So that what I was saying here about the, um, these various choices here, suppose I chose this isomorphism so that this critical point becomes fixed. What does that reflect? That's essentially a reflection of the fact that, say, if I'm in the Mandelbrot set, I'm going to apply this in the quadratic case, but basically any, any situation sufficiently global that would give me a picture with uh, this infinite degree branch cover, you can say exactly the same things. There's some universal-ish aspect of all of this. But um, so for example, for example here, the sequence of these centers of the Mandelbrot set turns out that those parameters are related in, in precisely such a way that in the limit you actually do get a well-defined isomorphism, and lo and behold, it's a particular one. It's the isomorphism that sends this critical point here to the, this, this distinguished point here to the sort of uppermost critical point, right? This sort of, there's this checkerboard type picture here. Above this, this is univalent, and there's this point here. And then these other ones, there, so you can look at all, there's all sorts of, all of this asymptotic periodicity of the Mandelbrot set pseudo periods of the towards the cusp, you can infer that, or at least you start to see there's a program to infer that from this picture. So the killer app of this, uh, this is referred to as the marching of elephants into the cusp, right? And all the other cusps here with other shaped elephants, and you can get, you can say certain things about the limiting shape of these elephants. You can only say so much. You can look at the pictures, and it look like, looks like there's a Hausdorff limit, and, and there's a limb soup, and there's, nobody's ever going to prove they're equal. But you can say a lot from, from, this, from these pictures. You know, the killer app of this one variable discussion, I think, is Shishikura's proof that the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary of the Mandelbrot set is two. I think that put this theory on the map uh, for bystanders. All right, so I mean, all that, as I say, it's 40 years. It's hard to believe it's, it's 40 years since Duadi made this observation, right? So at this point, people have, whether they do it or not, people are, are perhaps used to hearing that there's some parabolic implosion argument. Somebody goes through these motions and cashes out some cool theorem about the, what called the asymptotic geography of parameter space. Okay, so that's, uh, that's say, perturbations of simple parabolics. So. I'm here today to show you some funkier things. <laughs> All right, so this is where, just I don't need it yet, but I just want to make sure this is connected. This is going to open to my email. I remember a talk of Thurston's at MSRI when that happened. You all get to see my pin. I say, this is an out not necessarily talking literally about this picture, but this comes out of a similar discussion. All right, so perturbations of this one here. So again, I mean, most of the setup, the setup of the general theory that, that legitimates all of the things that I want you to infer via caricature, right? All of that general theory, when it's written down completely, is all local or semi-local, right? So what it's, it does not matter that this is the cubic polynomial, polynomial or not, just that this is the next term after z. 
But if I'm interested in illustrating this in some parameter space of interest, then there's sort of two obvious uh, candidates for my base map. One would be, if I'm interested in cubic polynomials, would be this one, or if I'm interested in quadratic rational maps, and if I put the fixed point of infinity, it would be this one. And because I want to show you illustrations, I have to make reference to one or the other, and it just happens that in the historical discussion of these things, my work and work with, I should be saying, I mean, I mean it's, at some point this segues into work with Xavier and with suggestions motivated by Jean Ecole, which became a joint paper of the three of us. But then that was a very, very weird approach, <laughs> partly because it was, what Ecole originally gave us was even weirder. And uh, then Xavier made it look a little bit more normal, but it's still a, a different set of arguments. We weren't act we, were, we were really trying, we were using parabolic implosion, but we weren't trying to do it in the full blown way. I was, I was trying to find a one parameter uh, description of something which really morally wants to be discussed in terms of perturbations of two parameters. But that second part, the sort of more, uh, I don't know, more uh, official approach or whatever is in this, these discussions uh, in manuscripts uh, of, a, of um, Xavier and Karsten and myself. And Karsten was kind enough to send me one of these because my last copy of it was several laptops ago. Okay, so that will be one of the uh, illustrations I want to talk about. But I think before that, what I need to do now is um, say what I need to do to upgrade this picture. So think when I get to global, global things, everything I'm going to say, if I were going to give precise statements, which I'm not, everything I'm going to say would be morally true about neighborhoods of both of these or any other thing like that that you'd write down. What do you mean, any other thing? Well, I don't know. You could be in a, for example, if you had a degree four polynomial that had a parabolic fixed point like this and a super attracting fixed point somewhere else, and you perturb in a neighborhood of that, it's going to be similar phenomenology. How to formalize that is a whole other matter. OK, but it just so happens because of these historical discussions and because the pictures are a little bit cleaner, if you want to think of a global model, I'll be phrasing it in terms of perturbations of that one. Lavores was looking at perturbations of this one. OK, but for the local picture, it doesn't matter. So all right, so what is the local picture? So local picture is basically uh, the square root of the previous local picture. So uh, I have a little bit of trouble drawing this, though. So now I have a pair of attracting petals and a pair of repelling petals. This picture is getting a little bit busy here. I'm not going to necessarily draw all the overlaps. All right, so. This is where we're incoming. Again, if I had a global dynamics, then there would be a parabolic basin here. And you're marching in the parabolic basin towards the fixed point. But since it's a multiple fixed point, you have multiple attracting basins. So this side is also attracting. So this multiplicity, which is the formal parameter, the, you know, the m and z plus z to the m plus 1, also happens to be the number of attracting petal, or the number of attracting repelling petal pairs that you see. OK, so here you're marching in also, and here you're marching out, and here you're marching out. But you can't get, you, but all of these are walled off from each other, right? So my corresponding picture of quotients looks as follows. All right, so, I, I, all right, so the attracting one here is the vertical one in this picture. Repelling one is the horizontal pair. And maybe I want to annotate it just to remember, right? So in some sense, let's say that, I don't know if zero is the north or south pole, but it's supposed to somehow morally be the same with this. So I'll decorate this end here, which isn't really here, but we could compactify and put a point in. And then if this is zero, then that would have to be infinity. And if that point is somehow that point, then that means that this would have to be 0. And you have to actually get this right to uh, do any computations for this conceptually. All right, now on this side here, this is the, a C mod Z. This is a C mod Z, C mod Z2. They're all isomorphic. But 
no, none of those isomorphisms between them are part of the original dynamics because these are all happening in separate places. They're all walled off from each other. Now, there's the, there are these overlaps here. So as before, as before, there's a return dynamics, okay, which is uh, locally one-to-one -one near the ends. There's a return dynamics like so. It's not dynamics. There's a return map induced by the dynamics like so. No, no, that's not, I don't mean, no, that's not right. I should ruin my picture. There we go. And that's all that this system gives us. But then you look at that and you say, well, hey, I've got a bunch of C mod Zs with labeled north and south poles, right? So uh, just for fun, how about I stick in the, I mean, we already know, we're already going from the repelling to the attracting side, so we should stick in some isomorphisms from the attracting ones to the repelling ones, and I want to make sure I respect north and south poles, so there's a one-parameter family I could choose from here, and there's a one-parameter family I could choose from there, and I could play with those, and I mean, it's maybe not so interesting until I say I'm starting with something global, but then once I am, well then actually, there's some maximal extent of these with maybe a fractally boundary, and these are now these infinite degree finite type maps with lots of perhaps lots of critical points or just lots of things that could produce interesting dynamical structures. And now somehow it's varying these two parameters here. All the phenomenology, think of all the possibilities. This isomorph, so, and there'd, there'd be, again, in the global setting, a distinguished point here from the unique critical orbit on this side and a distinguished one here from the critical orbit on this side. And now if I want to play this game and say, oh, I don't know, let's make this one fixed. You know, well, fix, fixed slash period two, depending on when you, whether you want to actually literally identify these, send this to a pre-critical point back. Or, I mean, you see, this point here also has some pre-images over here. I could send it to one of those. Or if I'm a little bit more careful, Maybe I'd need a winding argument, winding number. I could arrange it so that these are pre-periodic. I could also arrange things so that I have parabolic points here, so I could do it again. I could arrange it so I have parabolic points here at the end, so I could do it again, right? It's infinite richness, right? And I mean, just the, the things that have been cashed out and understood in terms of applications is such an infinitesimal part all right, I'm, right now, I'm just talking about multiplier one and two parameters, and I'm going to give maybe the th three most elementary illustrations of that, let alone what you'd get if you generated more parabolics here, let alone what would happen if this multiplier here were actually one also, so that you could find yet another level of cylinders, let alone if you do that infinitely many times. So the theory of geometric limits, my graduate student fever dream, right, was supposed to be about, okay, to systematize all this, chapter one will be, here is the space of conformal dynamical systems, here's the topology, it's compact, there are limits, here's an a priori statement about what they look like, you know, go, go have fun, okay? It's easier said than done to actually write all that out, and I'm not as young as I used to be. Okay, but what I'm saying is that once you get the gist of how this works, particularly by seeing a couple of two-dimensional applications. Anybody, I mean, you, you can just sit, look at Z plus Z to the fourth and find something even more interesting, I'm sure. And this is presumably what Lowe has done, perhaps from different motivation. Okay, so this is the unperturbed setting, but I'm dressing it up with some isomorphism. Another point, is at this stage here, notice I, I chose to send combinatorially, in addition to these uh, parameter choices here, there's a combinatorial choice because I could have also, I could have also, actually I went like that, I could have also decided to do, to do this. So on this level here, may, oh I didn't actually, okay. I'm not sure which is which, I'd have to think about it. But one of these configurations of arrows corresponds, so, when you perturb, the point is when you perturb, once again, at least if you perturb generically, like this, splits, this now splits into three points, these various channels open, so locally things look something like this with activity perhaps going like that, and that would induce, say, for example, 
that type of behavior. That type of behavior might, might well be, for, you could also, for example, just throw in one of these isomorphisms, right? So an isomorphism like that looks like it corresponds to escaping through a channel that way. And then maybe if I put the other one here, it's just, it's part of the general theory that if you're going to get these in the limit from a perturbed picture, that the targets have to be different, that you can't send both of these to the same place. These are, these are just, these are the things that follow from the fact that the model, the caricature is a vector field. But in any event, there are, there are two combinatorial possibilities here. They're symmetric, right? The other one is that, the other one is that things are configured so that you end up doing this. So they're related by a symmetry, but there are two. And this is an important aspect of this discussion because when you go to higher, uh, higher, uh, degeneracy situations. Well, there's more and more. And I mean, in particular, I mean, if, here things already become quite a bit different. Here you'll have, here you'll have, uh, this is where I start making caricatures here because I don't want to draw these tubes anymore. So half of these are attracting, half of them are repelling. Let's say these are the, ah, let's say the, uh, let's say the green ones are the attracting ones here. Right, so. For example, there's now a combinatorial possibility where you have one going straight across and then two going like that. Again, there are rules that say that you can choose any isomorphisms you like so long as the arrows don't cross. And under those circumstances, there will exist a sequence, of course, not a unique sequence. It's always about asymptotics. There will exist a sequence of parameters in your original parameter space converging to the original degenerate parabolic such that, and I left it out here, but of course what we're going to do is on this perturbation we're going to try to find nearby fundamental domains to quotient down to cylinders and then try to say that somehow this process here converges to this process here, but in the limit gives us extra information. So a lot of the difficulty in the general theory is figuring out how to draw the regions such that you can say this. You can sort of do it by hand in the simple parabolic case. So this is where Lavoie has managed to do this by hand in this case. And you can use that, but to really push it any further, you want to do something involving vector fields. And then there's this version that Utkirk does using, um, you approximate a map by this vector field. And then there's an improvement of it. Okay. It was, presented as the reciprocal one form, but it's the same thing. There's an improvement, improved approximation. There's a scheme for better and better approximation. If you think of this as a vector field. By the way, this is one of these places where I get irritated. Not at people, at, <laughs> well, maybe beyond the point. But uh, I mean, this computation here is very, very seriously infected with coordinate choice. Right now, I mean, if I'm talking about polynomials, maybe there's actually a canonical coordinate, but that canonical coordinate is not relying on that too much as a crutch is maybe not such a good thing. And if this is a rational map, then changing coordinates, I will get something different here. So all of the preliminary steps, you know, for getting prefatal coordinates and all, will give slightly different regions and so on. And slightly, it's just in the limit, everything sort of becomes canonical and coordinate free. And of course, in a germ discussion, you could just co first conjugate F by an arbitrary local conformal transformation. And then you're doing this. So at some point or another, when, when I start to think about doing all this and trying to piece together. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Because we're running a bit out of time. OK, I'm going to be finishing soon. Which sequence? You mean over, over here in the double case? Oh, they could. I mean, they, they certainly could. In fact, that's actually one of the, maybe you're giving me a hopeful question to move on ahead, right? So, I mean, in any approximating case here, I look at my picture. This is, I could, this picture could be either one at this point, right? So it might well be that as I close my channel and push to the limit that some of these diverge, maybe this 
get sucked into that way or get sucked out to that way. And that's something we have to account for too. In fact, since I'm running out of time, maybe I should progress to that. I mean, I want to leave with, I want to leave, if I can have five more minutes, and I will close with that because this is something I want to leave for the next generation. But yeah. So let's say I get this, a picture like this in the perturbed case, and then I say pass to a subsequence so that things you know, tend to some limit. But that limit might well involve one of these things here disappearing, for example, and maybe the other one converging or maybe both disappearing, or something even more subtle, which I found out, it's on a page in Lavor's thesis. You have to be reading the thesis really closely to see it there because he doesn't have an application for it. It's just he wants to give a complete statement. It's a case he has to a priori consider. He doesn't even prove that this case necessarily happens, but he's diligent and systematic, and he has to take care of it. And it's the same in Ukrug's thesis. And in any other presentation, there's this phenomenon to account for that I like to call overshoot for some reason, wherein you can imagine it's, I'm not going to have time to justify it here by computation, but if you arrange it so that, say, these arrows here are degenerating, not to de degenerating towards here. You see, that would just be having a multiplier here going to zero. But if you have these isomorphisms degenerating in this way, then in the limit they disappear, and you don't have an isomorphism here. And similarly, if you have these degenerating in a particular way, then you don't have an isomorphism here. But if they degenerate in a compensated way, in a balancing way, you can arrange a situation so that your initial combinatorics suggested by the vector fields is, that was sending you this way converges in the limit to something where one of these arrows disappears and the remaining arrow goes the other way. And it does happen. I've done the computation in parameter space, and it does happen. All right, now, to quote, so Andre made a point in, one of the, in his talk that, you know, maybe you don't have to prove a theorem in a talk, but you should at least state a theorem. And I was going to modify that and say, well, maybe you don't have to state a theorem, but you should at least do a computation. But now I'm going to say, how about I just give a recipe for a computation, if I even have time for that? So and in fact, I'm actually, unfortunately, going to have to skip the other applications, which are illustrated with pictures. But that's actually largely published stuff. And I can show you the pictures privately. I don't have any, there is a dynamical phenomenon. I mean, so again, you can have fun and play the game here, arranging this, you know, carefully choosing your parameters here to convince yourself that you do get a nice, so in other words, again, I, start, I have the, un, the perturbed dynamics gives me a pair of arrows like this, which both degenerate in compensating ways such that in the limit, you get that, which somehow means that some, some which somehow means that, um, I don't know. I mean, I would say front and back, but it's two complex dimensions. There's, there's a particular mode of degeneration to something that you can sort of understand uh, intuitively from first, first principles. And then there's a sneaky way of getting around from the back, which is what this tells you here. The recipe for the computation is as follows. So um, everything here has been discussed in terms of choosing these transient isomorphisms, but you could, but you could, you could, once you choose normalization to the cylinders, you can choose your parameter for them to be uh, these multipliers at the end, say two of them, because, because multipliers are dynamical invariants, right? So if I feel like it, then I can actually give a coordinate-free description of this particular pair of induced transit maps as multiplier whatever at this end, multiplier whatever at this end, and then basically the holomorphic index formula will force, well, it's not fixed here, but it'll force this to be whatever it is. Um, and the point is the recipe for the computation is the following. How do I, how do I relate, well, all of these statements about the asymptotic, the asymptotics of certain things and so on can all be stated in these coordinates here of multipliers. So what's the relation between multipliers downstairs and upstairs? It's given by parabolic renormalization. It's given by sectoral, sectoral renormalization. Right, so this has come up in at least one talk. If you have multiplier rho here, and then you, 
say rho is close to one, but not one. And then you draw a curve here and its image here and fold it up and you get some kind of, you know, a cone, which is really a disk. And now you have a new multiplier and what's the relation between these? All right, so if you're on the unit circle, it's just renormalization of, of uh, it's, it's continued fractions and renormalization. But I mean, in general, this row doesn't have to be on the unit circle. So the formula, if you work it through, is that rho goes to e to the more than minus four pi squared over log rho, right? So that would be, this is a way you can relate multiplier at this end to multiplier, say, of this. And then, depending on the choice of, depending on the actual gate structure of this configuration, again, there are only two possibilities in the cubic case, but there's like a Catalan number's worth, I think, in the general case with radically different combinatorics. Once you, once you fix the combinatorial pattern, you can parametrize things by multipliers. But you see these, what you see here, what you see here, this multiplier, say, corresponds directly via that renormalization transformation to this multiplier. And this one corresponds by a sectoral norm, whatever, to this one. But this one over here, the relation's a little bit more complicated because you go out and you come back. So it involves a composition. OK, so this is the recipe, right? If, you, if this is stated clearly and if you understand it, and there are times I've understood it better than I do now, you can turn this into a calculation which proves that there exists a rather thin, snaky parameter region whereby things, quote unquote, sneak in from the back. But I've never seen an illustration of this parameter space or what it's supposed to entail. And I would like to. So anyone who <laughs> wants to do so, well, and again, Luo's work may have something to do with this. So I guess I will leave with that. I'll skip the intermediate applications. But thank you very much for the opportunity to present this. And thanks to Christian for helping me prepare this yesterday.